Okay. So you guys are gonna be famous. Alright? Say hi network. Hi network. They they really appreciate that. That's the thing. Uh, okay, so so uh, kind of vague question. Will there also be output for uh, our local comedy? Yeah, sure. I mean yeah. I mean ideally you're the output, right? Like, yeah. What you do. But anyway. Uh, okay. So uh, vague question, but useful I think. What is a what does a leader do, you think? And it's not like a right or wrong answer, right? What do you think a leader does? <laughs> you just hate the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean like if you were yeah. saying it's not a wrong it's true, that's true. Okay, do they lead? What else? Leader creates other leaders, not followers. Good, they create leaders. Anything else? Shares his passion. Huh? Shares his passion. Ah, okay, passion, yeah. Mm-hmm. Anything else? Provide example. Lead by example. Anything else? Direct people to goals. Yeah, there's a performance aspect. They have to be achieving something. Tracking performance. Yep, exactly. Anything else? Make sure everyone's going mm -hmm. the same goal. Unity, alignment, things like that, yes? Empowering. empowering people, cool. Anything else? Inspire. Inspire people with passion. Anything else? Yeah, so I mean, I think, I think the things you said covers it for me. Um, so I like to make things like super simple. Uh, for me, what, what a leader does is, is really simple. Uh, this isn't like a genius framework for everyone to copy down. This isn't ISEX official what a leader does. This is just, if you ask me what a leader does, I would say this. Um, so so the, the leader represents the purpose of what everyone's trying to achieve and leads people towards that purpose, the passion, the inspiration, right? So they have a clear vision for where we're supposed to go. If you think of an inner and outer journey, if you think of the concept of leading, it all implies a destination, right? A journey to somewhere, leading people somewhere, right? And the leader has to know where that place is and what it looks like. Performance, exactly as you said, uh, managing some results, tracking results. Uh, if performance isn't going well, making the right adjustments, there's a strategy uh, element to that. And people, so that's creating leaders, uh, empowering your people, enabling your people to be who they want to be, to be the best versions of themselves, to achieve what they want to achieve, right? And uh, there's culture and behaviors that go between all of this. Uh, meaning that what can connect these is like in the leadership style, the culture you create in your team and the behaviors you're role modeling to them to make sure that you achieve your purpose, that performance is done, and that people are becoming the best versions of themselves. This is at least how I would explain it. This for me is what I, what I want to see in a leader. This is how I want to be led as well. I want someone to give me a clear purpose to manage my performance, make sure I'm achieving the most I can, and to care about me and who I'm becoming. Uh, so all I'm going to do in this session is talk about some uh, concepts for each of these that I think are useful for leading a sales team or really leading any team probably. Uh, so for purpose, uh, on your blank piece of paper or laptop, I have a question for you. Uh, who are your heroes? Who are your heroes? My question. In what way? If you look up to them, they're your hero. For example, when I was a kid, one of my heroes was Michael Jordan. He was a hero. Yeah? Huh? Is another example. It's a private exercise, so. <laughs> no, just don't shout them out, guys. So you have some heroes, and uh, why are they your heroes? For each one, like, my hero because of this, because of this, I like this, I want to be like this. Whatever the reason is that they're your hero.
see a few people still writing. You guys like 30 seconds. Would anyone like to share who one of their heroes is and why? Yes? Yes, you had your hand raised as well. I mean, I think it's very cool to hear those from you guys. Like, very, very cool. Um, so, you you probably noticed, I mean, in media and books you read as a kid and everything, like, we, human beings are really fascinated with heroes, right? We like we like to hear stories of heroes and what they did. Why do you think that is? Like, and I, again, not a right or wrong answer, I just think it's interesting, right? Like, why, why do we tell each other all these stories about heroes? Yeah. Yeah. So we we feel that like we could be that maybe. Yeah, I think that's true. Other people have thoughts on why human beings love to tell each other hero stories. It shows that you do not have to be oppressed by any circumstances, and even though you often are, it will show that it's also possible to love you. Mhm. You can overcome challenges. Difficulties, oppression. Well, I'm not saying that everyone can, but I think yeah. that there is a possible. It's possible, right. Anyone else? Uh, I wrote down Will Smith because he has a really uh, big work ethic. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, he masters like the art of reinventing himself. So, first he was an actor, and then he had an. No, at first he was an actor. No, musician, I guess? Yeah. Then an actor. And so he tries to that on as well to his children, which are doing pretty big things as well. So that's the person I really 
Is there is there another reason we really like to hear about heroes or talk about heroes? Yes. Yeah? I think it's because um, it's the whole idea that they can do that everything is possible with a superhero. So it's very ide idealistic of us to put them out there. If these people that we grew up watching, for instance, like the fictional superhero, if they can do it. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. So we, we can we can reach our dreams, kind of thing. Anything else? Yeah. So so they have things you there's things you want from them, or so like things you respect about them. Also, often they have a flaw that makes them like human, right? So you can relate to them in some way, which is again the thing I could do it too, right? Like I could be this person because they they were flawed, so I. Yeah. Anything? Else? Um, the thing that it's not like this miracle that helped them, but really the the way or process that um, made them what Right, some human element. Yeah? Yeah, we'll take one more and, and then I'll... Maybe you can identify it in part of yourself in the video and you know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think I think all the things you, you guys are saying are, are totally true. So especially, especially we've, I think all those fall in some categories of like, we could do something, like we could achieve something, also like we can overcome our challenges. I think those are things that really inspire people. I think there's, there's another thing, which is that all the people that you were mentioning, I think all the people you were mentioning, um, they symbolized something, or they represented a greater struggle than just like, I don't know, everyday life or something. Like, you know, my father did this and sacrificed so that I could have this, so that we have this, right? Or this person, he, he was determined, and what that symbolized was, this. Anything can be done with hard work. He passes that on to his kids, right? So there's always like a greater purpose behind the people that like inspire us, right? There's something bigger that they represent and that they're fighting for that we believe in, right? So um, the, the whole essence of this is, is, is I, I think that you and the people you're leading uh, want to be heroes. And they, they want to have some heroic story as a result of their experience working with you and, and working in ISEC, I think. They want to be able to, to look at a purpose and see that they overcame specific, very difficult challenges and came out of it a better person and achieved what they wanted to achieve so that they've proven to themselves and to the world that they matter, right? And that they've, they've contributed something. I think this is something that, one thing of many that drives people, right? The possibility of having a story that's compelling that means that you've contributed something uh, and that, uh, I don't know, you have some permanence in the world. You and I think that's also why we want to be a part of something like an idea, because it's permanent, right? We will perish, but we fought for something that will live beyond us, that kind of thing. Um, so, uh, who, who's heard of the hero's journey? Yeah. Yeah, it's a literature thing, right? The hero's journey. So, it's, it's, a, it's a very specific, like, form that stories go through in literature uh, to, to fulfill this, like, image of what a hero is that we have. But I'm going to simplify a lot, okay, and just talk about how it applies to a team. So, so the, the hero's journey always begins with, like, a, like, and you can think of, like, Lord of the Rings or Star Wars or anything, like a society that, or a society that's envisioned or something, or a world that's envisioned, and then a gap, right? So this is, this is the reality. It's really bad, or, like, the empire is going to conquer us or anything like that. Hunger Games, blah, blah, blah. Um, so the point is there's a, there's a hero, like your team, or you, who has, who has a vision of, of what should be happening, right, and what needs to change. Uh, and uh, when they try to do that, they run into different challenges along their journey, right? And these challenges tend to get, like, more and more and more dire uh, until, and, and usually in a hero's journey, there comes a, a part of rock bottom. The, the hero reaches the rock bottom of their, of their hero's journey, where they try to give up, they try to go back, they, uh, any of those things, right? They, they, they basically don't think that they're the right person or that they're good enough or anything like that. When, when, and by the way, what my point with all this is that you're living a hero's journey all the time and you're living multiple hero journeys. And when, when we're at this point is when we feel things like guilt, fear, exhaustion, anger. Exhaustion, like burnout, right? Like I've given everything, oh, it's not going anywhere. It's just, it's not possible, right? Or like, yeah, I mean, this role requires this and my personality is just much more like this, so I'm not the right person. You know, like those, those kinds of things. Uh, or I let everybody down, and I, I, there's no way I can recover from it, so I, I have to just like quit or something because I just hate feeling failure every day and seeing all the people that I let down, right? That's when, that's when we're at like rock bottom. And in, in every one of these situations, uh, 
who, who feels they've been at rock bottom in some aspect of their life before? Yeah, okay, many people. Um, there, there's basically only two directions from rock bottom. You give up, uh, which is not the end of the world. It might not be a journey you have to fight, right? It might be something small, or that you're going you're gonna to go into another hero's journey now. Um, or or you, you break through, right? And you, you come out of it. And in the hero's journey, that typically comes from, uh, from like, a mentor. So, like, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Gandalf, right? So somebody who, like, convinces you you can do it and gives you the tool or, like, the elixir or whatever you need to be able to complete the mission, Dumbledore, that kind of stuff, right? Um, or, in, in our case, uh, it might be a mentor, like a leader, or it might be your purpose that carries you forward. So, an idea, right? Like, okay, I, I might not be the right person, I fucked a lot of things up, I'm, I'm like, not perfect, but this is something I believe in, and I'm going to fight for that. Like, this I, I absolutely do believe in. And I don't know if, I, if it's the right thing, but if I can get it right with this, then I've done my mission, right? That kind of thing. Uh, and so that you, you experience the breakthrough, which this is when you take, like, control, right? It's that feeling of, like, I'm going to do it. Uh, when I was talking to someone about this, uh, they, they, were, they were, like, listening to what I was saying. And like, I'm going to do what I want. They just, like, said it. I was like, yeah, that's exactly it, right? It's that moment when you're, like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do what I want. Like, this is what I envision, and I'm, I'm going to do it. I've, I've hit tons of challenges. I thought I couldn't do it, but I'm just going to go for it now. And, and if, you, if you have that breakthrough, then ideally it leads you to the, to the realization of success, right? Um, how many of you have gone through some journey like this in your life? Okay. Would, would anyone want to share? Like, what, it, could, it, it doesn't have to be something super dramatic. It could be like you were part of a basketball team and this and this and this, right? That, that's also why we like sports and those things, right? It's this constant journey that we can see. Uh, any, anybody want to share? Yes? Um, I was very shy in, uh, in school and I moved to Virginia nine months ago and it was very hard for me to talk about sex and all these things yeah. and then I w went to Brazil and I saw myself as this person with like so many ma masks on me because I was uh, very afraid to show my real self yeah. and then I met this girl, she was very natural and I thought mm -hmm. to myself, okay, I can be right now the first time honest with, with a girl and I said, okay, listen, I really like you and you are the first girl that I really like and I think that's it. And she was like, well, okay, that's cool, but uh, you will marry me now? And it was like very awkward, very <laughs> awkward moment. Um, but in the end it was like the, the first time that I really was honest with someone and there were no, um, like, there was so, uh, we were so close because there was no distance because of this mask and it was like one of the, yeah, the inspiring things. And you realized success? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's an awesome story to share. Really, I'm very impressed that you share that. That's very cool. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? <laughs> Everyone just shares the same version of it. So I was 16. <laughs> and that is kind of everyone's individual hero's journey at some point, right? That's interesting. Anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've also been through this. So uh, I, w I would say that in my, in my AI experience, I've, I've gone through some of this journey, and I'm, I'm somewhere around here right now. Which is that the, the strategies I'm trying to implement come from a very deep place of what I believe the, is right for ISEC, what I believe the program is about, what my values are, uh, what I believe the world should be. And before before I came to that realization and like passion and like this is this is what I want to do. I want to do this because it's what I believe in, and I, I I'm going to go for it. Before that, I, I had a lot of doubts and guilt and wonders. Maybe I'm not the right person, and what if I fuck all this up? And this is an organization I love, but I could ruin it. And it's really, you know, it's very very heavy, right? Um, because there were a lot of challenges and, and that I'd run into. But I, at some point, thanks to I think myself and a very encouraging environment and a great team leader and stuff like that. Uh, at some point, I came to believe in myself and what I was thinking and what I wanted to do and was given the support I needed, and I have, I think, experienced a breakthrough, and I hope to see a realization of success from that, but that's, that's where I'm going, right? Um, so, so applying this to your team, uh, on your blank piece of paper, uh, what I'd like you to, to write is, what is, your, what is your team fighting for, do you think? What is, what is the thing that's in their, their journey that they're trying to fight for? Yes, that's the idea, is that it's your, your whole team.
And uh, what I'd like you to think about is, uh, when is the last time your team talked about that purpose, about what they're fighting for? It's a slightly different track, but it will end up in the same place. Uh, what was the most challenging decision you've made in your current team experience? I just want you to, to think about that and write down this is the most challenging decision I made. It was this. And the simple question, did you consider your team purpose in making that decision? Okay, same piece of paper. Um, can you make a list of the people that you're leading? Like a, a list of your team members. Basically. What are their names? And next to each person's name, I want you to write, um, what do you think is, is their main motivation? What are they fighting for? Yes, in their role. Hi. Hi. Uh, we have some chairs available over here. If there's not any over there. So I, I see several people have the list of names, don't yet have their team members thing, so we're going to wait until those people have it. So sorry if you're already done, but we'll wait a minute or so.
how many people have everybody's names and what they're fighting for? Okay, so I'm waiting on the rest of you. Then. It's okay. Um, uh, ask questions how to uh, handle this Okay, so uh, we'll have to move on if you haven't uh, figured or finished everybody in your team. Uh, the question is, the people whose names you wrote down, the people who you're leading, and their main motivation, how many of them are connected with what your team is supposed to be fighting for, or your team's purpose, right? This is a rhetorical question, it's just I want you to, like, you can look, and, and then in a minute we can share some reflections on that. So from me asking these questions and you writing those things down, did anyone have some like thoughts or reflections about how how their team is driven and how their purpose translates to their team? Well, uh, my thought was just that I don't actually really know what they want to do. I don't I know like yeah, the typical typical things I guess I want to tell them that I want to take on responsibility. Maybe some people realize that they don't know their, what their team members are trying to achieve and what's their main motivation. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, someone else? Questions you had, thoughts you had? Yes? I, I was thinking that uh, uh, for my members, we, we recruit them, uh, ask, explaining them what they would gain from the experience, their experience in ISA. But maybe, and maybe it's just in my team, but uh, maybe I haven't told them enough about what their impact would be and what they should fight for in this way. So maybe they more think about what they would gain themselves than what they would uh, product on, on the society and the market or anything. So. Mm -hmm. and, and you probably need both. Like thinking again to the three circles, there's yeah. the organization by yeah. and the individual by. Yeah. So they, they should see what am I experiencing yeah, and getting as well as what am I... For the, for the, what, what is this fighting for? I was trying to put the, the three aspects of the question. Yeah. Right. So, so what that means to me, practically, is that the members understand the individual value of the product they're experiencing, and you understand the organizational value, but that in your TNP, let's say, the TNP experience of your team is not connected for them, maybe. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I realized that even though I believe that I know what my members are here for, yes, they all want to this, the individual value some organizational body, but um, deep down, since I know a couple of them personally, I know that the, the main reason behind it isn't necessarily because of the, the leadership. I mean, the leadership is just a plus size, the plus on there. For example, I have one person that is here because uh, when we enroll in, in ISEC, we get um, from one to three points when we go on our Erasmus. So that's what she's here for. Other, other, another person is here because there are a lot of pretty girls in RLC, and the leadership was a plus size. So, so yeah, I just like that. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Yes? Um, our <clears throat> purpose is to make the exchange a great experience for us, for the user, and for the company. And my team is like five members. And Four of them are very uh, interested to challenge themselves and also to um, yeah, grow as a person. But one girl, she's like only there for the CV. Yeah. And I don't know right now how to handle her and what tasks I can give her because 
to other people, I can really delegate things and I can say, okay, I will challenge yourself because you want to. But she's like, okay, it's easy. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think I think people being led by purpose is like a massive transformation in a human being. Like if you're thinking of like the let's say like the levels of consciousness in a person's lifetime, being led by your impact on the world equally or more than your like what you're trying to get out of this individual thing or something like what what's in it for me attitude is like a huge shift for a person, right? And mu much less so for them to make that transformation and not only make that transformation but focus on what you want them to focus on or what Isaac wants them to focus on as the purpose of their team experience, that's a huge challenge, right? Um, I would, I, I think it's quite idealistic to think that every one of your team members if you, is like going to be 100% on exactly the same page as your team purpose and driven, right? But the, the closer you get them to there... The, I promise, the harder working, more performing, more impactful experience you're going to have, right? So I, I give you in the next slide some advice on how to lead your team with purpose, not because I think it's easy uh, or, that it, or that even you're going to do it perfectly with, these, with this advice, but just because I think this advice can help you get closer to that, which is going to be a better team experience and create more performance uh, than not doing, let's say. So uh, some advice I have for leading your team with purpose. So it's basically corresponds to the questions I asked you on the slide before. So make sure there's something your team is fighting for. And I'd say something that people can be proud of, right? Again, people want to live a hero's journey if you can show them that that's there, right? If you can, if you can show them that this is possible for them, many people would want to live that experience. They just don't know maybe that it's available to them. And so you want to you give them a vision of, well, this is what you could be achieving. And like, this is what our team can achieve. And that's the impact of that on the world. Um, and, and for me, yeah, like, what, what would you be proud of? For example, if you, if you take the ISEC in Spain's GIP, right? Imagine being a team member or a team leader in ISEC in Spain. You could tell people in the world what you're doing, what you're fighting for, and be proud of it, I think, right? Um, and I, I think that makes it easier to lead your team and makes, them, makes their leadership stronger. Remind your team of the purpose of what they're doing, like, constantly. Remind them of the bigger picture and why, why it's valuable. And, and maybe not just remind them, but listen to them. Talk about that as well. Have them speak about the purpose. Role model being purpose-driven by putting your purpose at the center of important decisions. So that, that's why I asked you guys uh, what's, what's like the most important decision you've made and was your purpose a, a key factor. So this is a, this is a huge thing in organizations. And, and like you'll, you'll read about the same thing with companies like leadership and stuff. Is that companies have certain values that they say they, they stand for or something. Um, but ultimately, their decisions are profit-driven, not values-driven, or something, right? And for let's say for a generation of young people that's more values-driven, that's hard. That that's a it's hard for them to employ you guys and and keep you in their organizations because most of us ultimately want to be part of something that's impactful and values-driven, and it can make a profit. That's great, uh, but we want to see that there's alignment between what people believe and what they do, right? And especially leaders, you want your leader there to be an alignment between what they say and believe and what they do. And you should role model that. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know when you, when you answered that question, what's the most important decision? Did you consider your team purpose, like what, your, uh, what, what you found out or what, what you discovered? Uh, but I, I think for myself, when I ask myself that question, I can look at a lot of important decisions I made in ISEC where I wasn't thinking very much about ISEC's values or our purpose. I was just thinking about like the short term or what's going to be easy or what's going to get results or something like that. Uh, and I can also think about decisions I've made more recently where I've been very values or purpose driven and I'm much more satisfied with those. And those are often the harder decisions, right? And, you, you know, you might have heard this thing, like, um, values is what, values, it's something like values are, are what you keep to even when it's difficult, otherwise they're not values, they're just hobbies, right? It's like, you're, that's the point of having a value is that you're, you're not going to compromise on it, right? And uh, help each person connect with your team's purpose, and I would just say, like, it takes baby steps, right? I mean... I don't, think, I don't think most of you had like a light bulb moment where all of a sudden everything in ISEC made total sense to you and you were totally purpose driven. There might have been a series of small light bulb moments. Uh, and so you don't, I, you shouldn't expect that you can go home tomorrow and talk to your team members and they're all purpose driven by the end of the week. Um, but you can make them take baby steps. And ultimately then that's, that's also going to be leading them to be leaders in the future because they have the vision that they can lead a team with in the future. So that's some advice I have about leading your team with a purpose. For me, like the, the big takeaway is, is that people want to live a journey that's impactful for the world, and they need your help getting through the challenges 
and the rock bottom to see that they can break through and achieve something great. Uh, yeah. Any questions about purpose or things that are unclear? We're going to move on to performance. No. Yes? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think if you want your team to be bought into the purpose, you sort of have to create it together. Um, I wouldn't. That's not enough, right? Like them, them creating it in a certain space is different than like it's what they're living every day. It's what they're thinking about. Uh, Raphael or or Blaze, it's like really hot in here. Can is there any way we can get like air conditioning or something working? Like that maybe. Somebody can help us with that. I'm okay with a little noise if it makes it cooler. Is that okay for you guys? Uh, so yeah, we can open the window. Uh, also, if we could get the air conditioner figured out, that would be great. The other one too. Does it work? Does it air? Air. Uh, is the heater on? The heater is on. No. <laughs> All right. So hopefully crisis averted. Question. Sorry guys. Guys, guys. Question. Yeah. I have the feeling that there is no really team purpose and that my members are doing it for individual uh, development and yada yada yada. Um, and I know there are some great things in history for which, uh, for which their, uh, their subjects also just did something because they did it for themselves and not for a team purpose. How do you think they did that and how do you think we should solve it in the same way? I think, uh, let's, let's see if uh, later in people I have a right. Just like purpose, performance, people. Let's see if that question gets tackled, and we can bring it up with not. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Please. Yes. Don't talk. Uh, okay. So we're gonna talk about how to make a performing team. So uh, I have a very once again. I like very simple things. Okay. So the unofficial, very simple way to make your team perform is to make your team ready to perform, make them perform, and then help them perform better. That's yay for me. Okay. Uh, I figured it out. I cracked the code, guys. Uh, so, uh, how do you do all this? Uh, so, uh, I've often talked about the early success window. This is something I believe in. All I mean by this, and this, this is talking about that first part, making your team ready to perform, is that I think the, the time immediately after a member joins ISEC or after a member joins your team is a critical time. And the faster you get them ready to perform and performing, like the much more successful they're likely to be in ISEC. Like, whether they have their first sales meeting in week one or week five, I think is a huge determiner of how long they're going to be in ISEC and whether they're going to become a leader and if they feel confident about themselves and stuff like that. I honestly believe the reason I'm still in ISEC is because on my first sales meeting, I, I was able to raise a TN. Not at that meeting, but with the company that I met at like the second meeting, let's say. So at the next like 40 meetings, I don't think I raised any TNs, right? But I thought I was really good. Because I was like, yeah, I raised a TN at my first meeting. What up, right? And honestly, I, I was a very busy student at this time, like, good grades and everything, like blah, blah, blah. I mean, if, if I was doing something for two months that I wasn't being successful at, I definitely would have quit, like definitely. I was just like, fuck it, I have too much other stuff I'm really good at, I'm not gonna spend time on this that makes me feel bad, right? It makes me feel like I'm not good. But I did feel like I was good, and so that's why I stayed in the organization, I think, and then I learned a shit ton of stuff that kept me going. Uh, so the main thing, super simple, train people really, really fast. For example, when, uh, when I would bring members into my IJP sales team, we would basically give them all the sales training they needed in the first week. So for example, Monday we would have uh, like why of ISEC and what GIP is and our product. Uh, Tuesday, I think we would have like uh, our value proposition and how to sell our value proposition in a sales meeting. Thursday, we would have like um, cold calling training and then they would do cold calls. And then like during the weekend, we would meet up and uh, do like all the steps after the raising and like how to do account management and matching and stuff like that. So of course they don't learn everything 100%, right? But they learn enough for them to like go out the door and start doing it. You've all heard, I think, the thing like uh, learning is generally uh, what 10% training, 70% practice, 20% feedback, right? 
so we, we hear that. That's like, I guess, scientifically true, proved by some scientist somewhere. But we don't like change anything about that. We still just train people a shit ton and give them some practice and very little feedback most of the time is, is what happens. Uh, so also, yeah, so train people very, very fast. If you can give them all the sales training in one week, great. Um, you just need them to know the content to be able to do their jobs and, uh, yeah, and teach, sorry. Yeah, and then give them, give them assignments to learn what you've taught them starting like week two. So for example, with my sales team, week one would be sales training, they would do cold calls in week one, and week two, they would already go on sales meetings. Not ones that they raised, my experienced members would, like during recruitment, my experienced members were responsible to create a pipeline of meetings so that when my new members came in, there were meetings for them to go on to learn how to do sales meetings, right? So then they get feedback on their sales meetings and all that, like, you know, so that they go to their first meeting and the experienced member tells them, like, so this section of the meeting, you can handle that, I'll handle the rest, right? So they get their first experience doing a sales meeting. Go to the second sales meeting, they do a little bit more. Third sales meeting, they take care of it, but there's an experienced member there. Actually, we would usually do that in the second meeting. Like, there's an experienced member there to, like, help them with anything, um, but the but the new sales member is leading the meeting. Question? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what if you start a cold calling and you don't have any um, how many meetings or anything like that? So you're saying, what if you're starting, like you don't have the experienced members, they have a pipeline of meetings and you do the cold calling training and they don't get any meetings or something like that? Um, get a, right now we don't have any how many meetings like for every team member like from one. Yeah, then, then I would say you need to raise them, like mm -hmm. you need to, if, if your team won't or something. I mean, every, for me, everything starts with there has to be sales meetings. Like, there just has to be sales meetings, that's where people learn, it's also where TNs get raised. So like, if you don't have sales meetings, you don't have a place for your people to learn, and you don't have a place for TNs to get raised. Uh, so you just have to get them. Um, yeah. Your scenario is our greatest, best case scenario when everyone is performing great and life, life is still happy and good. It's unfortunate, but it's true. No, no, no. I mean, so I'll, I'll tell you. I'll, I was going to tell you this in a minute, but when I when I started leading my sales team, there was nothing. There's absolutely nothing. And within three months, we had the most sales meetings in the country. And it's not because it's not because of anything like super, super special. Like it's because of things I'm going to talk about, basically. But I, I do know your reality. I think. I, I came from an LC that was on the verge of disbandment uh, because we hadn't done, we hadn't had any IJP in years, and a year later we had the most IJP in the country. So it can be done. Like it really can be done. Um, yeah. So, but it starts with you as the leader, right? So if you don't have if you don't have sales meetings from your team, then you need to raise the sales meetings for your for your new members to go on. Then they get experience. Then you push them to raise sales meetings. Then you start getting sales meetings. I'll talk more about what to do with that. Uh, so yeah, the point is you, you train people and then you give them assignments of what to do. All right, you've gotten this training, do cold calling. You've gotten this training, go on a sales meeting, right? So then when you, how do you make them actually perform? Uh, so anybody who's gotten like any sort of sales training or IJP from me probably remembers this. Uh, yeah, very simply, you need a standard of weekly performance for your members and you need to hold them accountable to it. To me, this is like everything. Is For example, in my sales team, uh, there was one sales meeting per week. That was like the standard. And when I set that standard, in the previous two quarters, I think we had, had two or three sales meetings, right? Like as an LC. Two or three sales meetings in like six months. But what I knew was it's possible to raise a sales meeting every week. Like I knew that that was humanly possible. And I also knew that like I only wanted people that were going to be intense and, and create that kind of sales intensity, right? Uh, the, 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 the. Yeah, another example would be if, you're, if your LC is more mature and you don't need more sales meetings every week, another example could be every one of your accounts should move one step in the process every week, right? So you chart out your raising to realization process in 10 steps or something like that, and every account should move week to week, and then every week you're tracking all of your accounts, right? That's if, you're, if you have more TNs to be managing. Yeah. Standard performance should be per team or per person? Per person. Per person. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely per person. Uh, one, um, sorry. one sales meeting per week per person. Yeah. Well, so here's my question: Is it possible? Of course, it's possible. Yeah, of course. So if someone doesn't want, if so, if it doesn't happen, why didn't it happen? Like, if it's possible but it didn't happen, why not? Because they don't think it's possible, because they don't have the training, or because they don't want to. I think 
they don't want to is the main thing. And that doesn't mean that they like don't want to do sales theoretically or something. But what I would say to my members is like if you really wanted a sales meeting, you would have gotten a sales meeting. Like if, if you really wanted it. The what I would actually say to my sales members, I was really nice to my team, okay? Like I was very accountable to them, but just letting you know. Anyway. Um, so what I, well, the example I would use with them is like, so if I if I had like your puppy and I was gonna shoot your puppy in an hour if you didn't raise a sales meeting. <laughs> you would raise a sales meeting. Like, I don't know what you would do, but you'd figure it out. You'd start making shit tons of calls. You'd call your mom. You'd, like, talk to everybody in the school. Please, I need a sales meeting. Please, I need a sales You would do it, right? It's just whether or not you wanted to. That's the only limitation to people getting a sales meeting. That's, that's not impossible. Everybody can get a sales meeting. And I mean everybody. Like, there was a, there was a kid. Uh, in, there was a kid we recruited who is, like, like, a disaster in any kind of sales, like the worst salesperson you can imagine. He could he couldn't like talk to people without sweating and like puffing. <sighs> and, like on, I, I swear, like I, I listened to him do cold calls and like I couldn't even understand. Like the sentences weren't even going together. It was just like honestly, he could not communicate anything about ISEC at all. And that kid was able to raise a sales meeting through a cold call. So like once he did, I was like, none of you, none of you can say anything. Like he can get a sales meeting. All of you can get a sales meeting. Um, so yeah, that, that's and, and I think I think in some of your more like mature entities, like one sales meeting a week is a, is too low a standard. It's, it's really too low. Maybe in some of your LCs, I don't know how, how high scale some of your LCs are, but uh, there I would say more. Uh, for example, if you have more current partners and a stronger network, it's easier to get sales meetings. So in that case, one sales meeting isn't good enough. Yeah. How do you make your team do it, do that and while well, they also have like a shitload of like. So all you can do, all you can do is make it easier for them by giving them really good training and by showing them that you're able to do it. If they honestly don't have the time, then they really just shouldn't be in the IJPT. Like, it's just sort of simple. It's like, oh, you really want to, but you just don't have time to raise sales meetings. Well, that means you don't really have time to be in the IJP team, so you're a great person. Maybe this just doesn't work for you, though. Um, like, for me, that's just like a factual thing. But yeah, if you don't have time to raise sales meetings, go somewhere else. Well, I mean, what else are they going to do? <laughs> Right. No, but it's like, I don't know, I have the feeling that at the university, they, like, a lot of the uh, hours are, you have to be at school, so they can't really go everywhere, and, like, the sales meetings, for us, it's, like, pretty far traveling, so at least some are in town, but the most are, like, half an hour or an hour, and then you'll be gone, like, for at least four hours to go to the meeting, yeah. the meeting and you go back. So they also have to do a lot of calls and have to do school. So either IJP is impossible to do, yeah. in which case you shouldn't do it, or it is possible, and those are excuses, kind of. Like, meaning those are challenges, but you can overcome them. And, like, to be, I'm, I'm just going to be really honest, like, there are entities all over the world that have way more difficult challenges than that, like, way, way more difficult. I mean, for example, I was in, I was in Kenya for Pioneers Conference, and I was talking to the VPBD of ISEC in Rwanda, right? So she doesn't speak the language in Rwanda. Like, she doesn't speak the language, and she's their main salesperson. And she doesn't have any members. Like, she doesn't have any, there were no members when she got there. She's MCVP IJP. She, there's no IJP members, and she doesn't speak the language. And in Rwanda, they're particularly suspicious of foreigners because of a lot of stuff in their history, right? So she's a foreigner from Kenya, doesn't speak the local language, doesn't have any members. She's able to raise TMs. Like, honestly, it's just, or, or like, in China, LCPs get questioned by the police. And their and their campus, they, their LCs get shut down on campus. They're not allowed on many campuses to run ISEC, and they still raise IJP. You know, so it's it, either it's impossible or it's possible but challenging. And then yeah, life is challenging, so that's what we're here to learn how to do, overcome challenges. So let's do it. Um, what? <laughs> so my my question for you guys is, uh, what what do you think your standard should be? For me, it was one sales meeting per week. Uh, as I said, if I were still leading my LC a year later, I would have increased that standard because that was too easy by then. Like, we had enough of a network and enough experience that raising a sales meeting wasn't a huge challenge. We had we built up the momentum, right? Um, so for you, what do you think the standard should be? Figure that out for yourself. I, you don't need to answer it, but that should be clear for you. For me, if you leave this summit and you, you have a clear standard for your members of what it means to perform an IJP and you role model it yourself, you're much more likely to be successful. If you don't do that starting this week, then I, I, for me, like objectives of the summit are not fulfilled. It's just a very simple thing. Uh, yeah. I have another question about the members, actually. Because um, the best profiles for IGIT in our university are the business students. Mm -hmm. And the business students are part of the hardest faculty. 
that are really like correct. It's very bad that the attendants, I mean, the managers, yeah. they have a lot of time to do. They're the best profile, but they don't necessarily have the time. Other people, even if you try to trade them, they don't necessarily have like this, this little plus thing that is just because they can help me try uh, I mean, if they don't have, once again, if they don't have time, that's impossible. So then you have to go with the best people you can, right? So then you have to recruit people from elsewhere that have the right profile, let's say. Personally, coming from my reality, I mean, I don't know how you guys feel. Coming from my reality, I, I, I don't feel that people who study something, like, that's so important for sales. Like, or, or I think people of a lot of personalities can also succeed in sales. Like, yeah, so I think, I think it's more just in what way can they succeed, right? They might not be the like, they might not have super high business acumen, but they might be very empathetic and very good at communicating, right? Um, so again, I just put it in the like, it's either impossible or it's a challenge, in which case you overcome it. And if it's impossible, just shut down IGFP and your LC and start, start growing an OGCDP. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so once you have this like standard, what's super important to drive performance in your team is you have to track these things. You have to track the same things every week. So for example, I would recommend tracking something like this. So this is me, Raphael, Elisa from the Netherlands, Joseph from Germany. Uh, so I don't know how your terminology is. Maybe you have different terminology in your countries. Uh, but for example, let's say you have contacts, sales meetings. If a sales meeting goes well and they're interested in working with ISEC, that's a lead. And then you have TNs raise, match, realize, and re-raise, right? So you want, for each person, to know exactly what is their performance. Like what have they contributed to each of these. And this is why it's super important to have a CRM as well. So hopefully your country has a CRM that you're using. I think all of your entities do. Maybe not France. Does France have a CRM? Does France have a CRM? All right. But the rest of you I think do. Um, so it's super important you use that CRM for this. For my team, if it wasn't on the CRM, I just didn't count it. It was like, it doesn't exist, it's not on the CRM, so that's that. Um, yeah, so for example, from this, you can now do a lot of effective leading of your team, I think. One, you can see are people living up to the standard. So like, that guy is not living up to the standard because we said one sales meeting a week and he doesn't have it. So I'm gonna find out why. It doesn't mean I'm gonna like punish him. There's no point in punishing him. If he wanted to get it, he would have gotten it. So like, he didn't want to. So I just need to find out why he didn't want to. Does he not have time? Is he not passionate about this? Does he doesn't think he has the skill set? Does he not like me? But whatever reason it is, I need to find that out. Uh, and then I can see, is that a problem I can help him overcome or not? So, yeah, for example, what should we do with Joseph, you think? If you're leading Joseph, what would you do? Joseph is this guy. Realistic? No. I really like Joseph, too. He's my buddy. Set up a feedback session with Joseph to find out how come that he didn't accomplish like the standard for the week and try to find out how come. And how can we improve this? Find out why and how can I help, right? Why is this the way it is and how can I help? Cool, what else? Use the example of the others who raised the standards. So how come that they have enough time, they, have, they did it and you're not? So maybe just share some tips from the others as well. Mm -hmm. Probably have a quote as well. Um, guide him towards everything that he's doing as well. Because um, if you see on the long term, who is actually the only one that has re-raises, and all the units are the contracts, so all the GNs. So probably get two suggestions from that. I just realized I made this like very extreme. <laughs> 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 Sorry about that, guys. I didn't mean that like that. Anyway, Raphael, you're very, I know you're trying. Yeah. <laughs> that's I'm a hard. Those are too good. <laughs> so that's that's right. You have a star salesperson. So maybe that's a question mark. It's not like for sure you should allocate that star salesperson to guide this team member. It depends on if that's what they're good at or something, right? But it's a question. If maybe I can have this person support them more. Okay. What else? Yes. Uh, it's, uh, it's saying five to ten 
times, and the next day we can call the twenty four times and then we we'll see what we have. Mm -hmm. So you can you can try to identify what is his bottleneck, help him overcome that bottleneck, and take a very active role, right? Like I'm going to sit with you and I'm going to do it. So there's a lot of accountability in that, right? Like you can't hide from it. I'm there, right? You like you know. Um, I don't know, something I wanted to say about that. One, one thing, just to be clear, uh, for me, I, with my team, it was one sales meeting per week, but I didn't, I didn't like have any demand of how they get that sales meeting. Like it wasn't, it didn't have to be through cold calling, it didn't have to be through referrals, it didn't have to be through anything. It's just at least one sales meeting a week. However, however works best for you, right? So then they would try new things and different things and stuff like that, right? But for example, if on Friday, or say they've been trying a lot of things and it wasn't working, then on Friday they're making a lot of cold calls because like, they know they have to get their sales meeting. Uh, anything else we can do with Joseph to boost performance? Yes? Uh, something else. Do you think that's a good or a bad thing? If um, Friday week don't get a sales meeting and on a Friday just keep goal going to get the result. Do you think that's a good because it, it seems to me that you are not intrinsically motivated? So I think uh, I think it is a good thing. It's just not an, it's not necessarily like a long term solution. Right? <laughs> so this question is like just make him get the sales meeting on Friday, or like sit with him until that sales meeting happens. So I think it's incomplete, right? Because you have to find out, well, why didn't he get it in the first place, mm -hmm. right? And if you can't answer that, then you don't know the, your full solution, right? Yeah. So if you, so, uh, Gary, the system is not covering everything, since um, whether he got it by doing his work at the beginning or by extremely cold calling on Friday, that doesn't, it's not shown by, the, by this uh, model. Yeah, so, so the, the purpose of this isn't, the purpose of this isn't like this is how you re-raise as many tans and, and like realize as many tans as possible. It's about making sure you have a standard of performance in your team, which I think drives a lot of sales culture. But it's a, it's a, yeah, I mean, you're right. And that's why like the questions are, well, what do you do with this information, right? So it's not just like in the team meeting, you can't just be like, yeah, so everybody got their sales meeting this week. Cool. Like that's not, that's not the point, right? But the point is by, by having a certain standard of performance and then seeing how people are doing and knowing what you can do for each of them, you know how, like, how to boost performance for that person, that person, that person, and what your team is struggling with, for example. Like, you might also see, as a team, we stop here, right? So I need to figure out how to do that better, stuff like that. Anything else we can do with Joseph? Yes? Yeah, the thing is also because Joseph didn't book any meeting, that means he's going to be stuck for the whole week trying to get this meeting. Maybe we can actually ask him to go on a meeting with another member or a VP or anyone else so we can actually move on to another step and then come back with that idea. It's like, yeah, this is how I can, if she can do it as a member, I can do it as well. So it, again, it's about to find out how, why actually didn't he actually book any meeting. It's like, are we questioning the methods or the motivational stuff here? But again, in the meantime, I can't keep asking him for doing the same thing. Okay, keep calling, keep calling. I need this meeting at the, by the end of the week. Because the pressure must be again must have like can have like negative aspects. Yeah. So I'm not asking to go and meet with someone else. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying this is the right thing, but why has no one said like put him on probation or fire him? Like how come no one said that? It's illegal. <laughs> what? He's not allowed to fire people. I guess you can just allocate them to teams that don't do anything. We can <laughs> I think then you, you allocate them to the, like, look at the sky team, and they can go wherever they want to look at the sky. <laughs> or like, the, the sleep team. Do what you want. Uh, so, so yeah, wh why, why did no one bring that up? Yeah? Um, in our LP, in our reality, actually, um, the, I don't Because you have a lot of accounts to manage, or what? To, to, What's the pressure? To, to make the, to the right, to finish the right calls for the right meeting, and to get the right meeting for the most of the expectations. Okay, cool. I'm interested in hearing from more people. Yeah? I definitely don't think firing is one of the first options. Like, first, you obviously hear his story, his side, try to maybe improve it. And I also don't think that maybe firing is exactly the way to go, even if sales just doesn't fit that person. I can always think like, uh, does a person maybe not fit on another position or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, 
When you are uh, leading I, uh, an IGIP team, at some point you need results. That was my biggest mistake uh, last year when I was with VER. Uh, I kept a lot of time like trying to motivate and coach my members and forgetting about the results. And this is why my year as a VPR was good uh, according to all the coaching I gave to my members. But for the results, nothing. So it is good to question yourself, but at some point you just need to, okay, if you need meetings, just do them with yourself and make sure you raise your own teams. Because in the end, it's about your sustainability. Yeah? Well, um, I need that you know this, right? Because I am a bit in the same mistake right now, but I will change next semester. But I would never fire one of my team members, because first of all, where I have five team members, they're really close for a small group. And I know that if they're not performing, it's never because they are not motivated, or it's always something else. Because now I know to be good personally. So firing <coughs> is never the way to go unless like this behavior has been going on for a long time and you try to talk and they are not reacting then you can fire, but it's never the first choice. Hmm. So questions for you guys. Totally good contributions. How long is long enough for someone to show that they want to perform? Like so of course it's not the first choice, but like how long would someone not perform before it's like, yeah, so you're just not going to perform forever, so that's that. Yeah? Okay, so can I ask And, and when do you cut the cord? I'm good. I'm seeing that there's no movement. I'm going to take three weeks after the cord. Two or three weeks after, after you talk to them, cut the cord. Rafael? Uh, no, I did when I was a VP. Actually, my first two weeks, I got a team that was not really performing. We had 17 members in my team. And I gave them an assignment, and all of them had to book meetings and give in results. Uh, and they had two weeks to do that. And the seven members had given what I asked them and just fired them. And it was the best thing I did for my team because it started performing. Because I had only that people that were doing nothing. I'd rather to keep the people who were doing really want to perform than keep those things that are not doing anything. It's kind of a leading question I have. But a question I have is can you make anyone do anything if they don't want to? No. Uh, of course you can't. Right? Like you can't make someone someone do it. So you're 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 right. I, so there, there's a there's a phrase I also believe in, which is if like if you're a leader, you're responsible for everything that's happening, right? But I would question whether you're always competent to fix that problem, right? So let's let's say like yeah, I've let this person down. I haven't led them well enough. But maybe I'm not. It's not possible for me to lead them well enough because what they need is something. They need to somehow deeply understand why this is important or be completely remotivated. And I do not know how to do that. So I'm not the leader for them as well. Like. That there's there's an aspect to that as well. Yes, you want to add something? Yeah, the problem that, that I have with my team is that when they show up to call in session, they're really doing the calls, they show up to track meetings, but that's where it ends. Like I can't motivate them even more to show up to the LC stuff, the stuff you need to do as an LC. And I was just wondering if someone else has this problem and how I can fix it because I don't want to get mad at them because they do what they need to do as, yeah. as the RICX members, but that's where it's off. So I, I, think it's a, I think it's a very good question, a good question maybe to use your time like with, with all these people for. I'm going to keep it a little on, on track for this. Um, so the question that we're tackling is a really big one in management, right? Like it's, it's not new at all. When do you fire people and how do you deal with non-performers, right? So there's a, there's a simple formula that every organization in the world seems to eventually figure out, and every leader seems to figure out, 
uh, which is that you have to have you have to like clearly address the problem, right? You have to set a timeline for that problem to be fixed and clear objectives of like how you would fix that problem. And then if it's fixed, good, and you follow up on it later. If it's not fixed, okay, then that's that. Like. If you wanted to be a part of this team, if you wanted to perform, you would have by now. We gave you the resources you needed. It's not something you want or something that's good for you right now. So then at that point, yeah, you can be reallocated to another team that fits with your skills. For example, maybe Joseph doesn't like raising sales meetings. In that case, he should not be on the team that's raising sales meetings. That doesn't make very much sense. Or maybe Joseph, bless his heart, is super not good at raising sales meetings. Well, maybe in a semester or so, he'll be ready to try that again. But right now, he needs to do something easier. Maybe he can be helping these guys match or something like that. Not that that's necessarily easier, but maybe that fits his skill set better, right? And what good is it going to do him to sit in a role for the next six months where not only is he not good, but he's not expected to be good? Like, you know what I mean? It's okay for him to just not perform. Who benefits from that? Like, what's the personal development of I cannot achieve and the people around me will say that that's okay? You're the person's leader. You're supposed to get them to be something better than, than what they are. So you have to hold them to some standard, not because, not because you're fighting the person, because you're fighting for who they're trying to become, right? Like, that's the person that you're responsible for. You're responsible for the better version of that person and helping them become the better version. And maybe for them to become the best version of themselves possible, they need to be somewhere else or they need to be told you're not trying hard enough. And as long as you're not trying hard enough, you're going to get fired from roles like this. So here's your chance to learn this lesson. You can come back next year. You can try again. But this is a lesson you should learn, because if you don't put in the effort, you're not going to achieve what you want in life, and that's that. And it's better for you to learn that in ISEC than to not learn it, be coddled, and go into the real world and be a failure, right? I personally believe very strongly that people achieve what they want to achieve. Leaders help them unlock their belief in themselves, unlock the motivation to do it, but people achieve what they want to. And if, if, you've, if you've given them your fair amount of resources, you have to do the best thing for them which is put them somewhere else or give them a clear message that what they're doing isn't good enough. Not only for them, but for your other team members. Because you have other team members that are trying to learn something out of ISEC and trying to con contribute aggressively. They're really trying to contribute to the world. And you're allocating your time to someone who's not. How does that make sense? Like, those people are losing out on their leadership experience because time is being taken away from them. And maybe you've all experienced this. I definitely have as a team leader. Or I spend... 60% of my time with two team members trying to make them perform, when in reality, this is not a role for them, like this is just not the place for them, or they don't want to actually. They say they do, but when it comes down to it, they don't actually put in the work. And I'll tell you guys, I am 100% for supporting people that want to be there and do stuff. Like, I had a lot of people on my team that were not, I, I'm not like a performance driven, I'm not like a only results guy, like I'm definitely not asking anyone that's like, I, I've led, like I'm not, I'm all about that person. I lead too much based on the people. But I also, like, I fight for the people that they're trying to become. And I hold people very accountable to that, right? I want you to become a better person. And for that reason, I'm holding you accountable. Because I don't want you to just be, you're, you're here because you want to be better. So I don't want you to just stay the way you are because we all should be better. Anyway, very long story about what to do with Joseph. Uh, but yes, all of the things you guys said were true. You can give, someone else can maybe support him. You should find out why he's struggling, is that he doesn't want to, whatever. And, and the basic formula is have a meeting with him, figure out what the problem is, set a plan with him for how to fix it. Okay, two weeks. Uh, I'll sit with you and do a cold calling thing like you were suggesting. We'll have you go on a sales meeting with this person. Then I need you to raise two sales meetings in the next two weeks. If those things have been done, then we're good. If not, if you, if you try really hard and for some reason you struggle, we'll talk about it. But if there's not effort, then, then we're done. Question? So basically, it's just a smart solution. You go to the smart? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And this is this is used everywhere. So like we shouldn't be afraid of it. You know? And and I, I would also just say as like a let's say experienced leader in ISEC, like you will learn this lesson eventually. <laughs> it's just how many things and how many people you fuck up before you do. <laughs> what should we do with me? Fire. <laughs> Yes?
And why, why do you say that? Because in your result you see that like from 14 contacts you have 12 TN raised and only five, uh, five, 8 matches and 5 uh, realizations. Yes, exactly. So it looks really good, right? And so you see, well, actually the whole point of this is to have leadership experiences created. This person is very good at raising TNs, including re-raises, but if less than half of them get realized, that's not changing the world, right? Um, and that's a very common thing in ISEC. And a common thing in sales in general, like in companies as well. You have people that are very passionate about selling, and their passion runs out the second they complete the deal, right? Because that's what they were fighting for, right? They were fighting for like the, like, yes, I got it, right? Rather than like the end goal, you know? So you have to be careful of that as a, as a leader as well. When you have your star performers, like C, if you have any star performers, uh, C, like once they raise, do they, do they really push forward for the match and the realization? Uh, anything else? Encourage. Maybe. Encourage. Yeah, encourage. Not specifically encourage, but more reinforce mm -hmm. uh, according to his performance. For example, this guy uh, just did really good, and I think it's okay to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some recognition. Yes? We also see that person wants to maybe have an extended role in like, training the others or something else. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have a thought. Yeah, I kind of have an issue with that because I personally believe that if someone is a real good seller and not making this his time training other people, I know it's really valuable for the rest, but like if he's good at selling and you have issues with it, yeah, if he wants it, that's something different. Yeah. But I would not push that person to go to coach other people to be like more keep selling, keep selling. You're good at it. I think I think it depends on the person and the context. Yeah. So I, I think both sides are true. Or not sides, both views let's say, are, are, are completely true. And it's a common mistake in, in organizations to move best salespeople into your sales leaders. It is, it's a, it is a common mistake that's like known in, in like sales leadership, don't do that. But it doesn't mean you can't do it. It just says like, don't automatically do it, right? Consider, is this actually the person that wants to do that? Are they the best person to do this? Um, what happens to your sales pipeline if that person goes away? Stuff like that, right? Uh, and there's an important thing you said, uh, which is to expand their role. I would say, think more responsibility as well as pipeline, right? So they could be pipelined to the next VP maybe, so I should make sure that that's happening. How can I give them more responsibility? I would, yes? Uh, actually, yeah, I think I would put more challenge to you, because otherwise you can enter on a comfort zone, and I think that you you be able to realize more things than five. So when, I, when I'm talking about challenge, it's like do a sales alignment, because as far as I, as I am seeing right now, maybe you are selling the Superman and that's why you are raising a lot of PNs, but the next challenge for you would like realize 100% of the, the, the raise that you get. So it's like keeping pushing you to see, to see that you can be successful with harder challenges. Again, I would say maybe. I say maybe depending on the person and what they want out of the experience, but but yeah, it's a very yeah, it's a very good point. Like you 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 don't have to do it overnight, but step by step you can do it. Yeah. So what I would what I would say is that uh, it depends where that person is going in, in the organization as well, right? So for example, that person learning matching and, and like realizations might be the right challenge for them. It might not. It depends on that person. It also depends on your team. For example, if you have other people who want to do that, maybe the right challenge for them is raising more, maybe the right challenge for them is becoming the team leader. No, no, it's just a, it's a thing. You're totally right. You should figure out how to give them more responsibility, challenge them more, right? For me, it's like this, the same kind of thing. But what exactly that challenge is, I would say comes down to both the person as well as the need in the organization. I wouldn't just automatically do it from the, from the numbers, let's say. Um, yeah, so, so interesting thing. I, I, I gave this session as well in Egypt. I was in Egypt last week. When I asked what should we do with Joseph, everyone's first reaction was fire, fire, fire. They're not wrong, right? The same as I don't think you guys are wrong. There's like a, well, organizations have learned that this is the way to do that, right? Because you do have to fire people probably. Like if you're never firing people, you have a lot of, A, you have a lot of people that aren't contributing anything, and the people who would contribute something have a lower standard to reach because there's tons of people around them that do nothing. So if they do something, they're good, right? Um, at the same time, if you just fire everybody at the first thing, you're not developing anyone, and you like 
create a lot of problems in culture and stuff like that, right? And when I asked what should we do with me, everybody said, more work, give him more work, he's really good, so give him more things, right? So interesting things culturally, right? Uh, and again, I would, I would modify that to be give more responsibility. Because more work will just maybe, maybe cause burnout or something, right? But maybe they can have a l larger influence on the organization. Uh, what about Rafa? What does he need? <laughs> like, try to understand how come he's only raising a third of his uh, meetings, what happened in the other meetings, what were the, actually have some kind of a market research, you know, what kind of profile the other companies were looking for and we couldn't find, um, because maybe we do not, because actually here in Belgium we have some specific uh, profiles that we sell uh, and com actually companies that we target like try to understand why this four other companies did not uh, accept any, any TN or anything and then, uh, according to that see how we can manage his speech to meet his amazing. Exactly, exactly. So you need to find out why that drop off is happening and and from that make different decisions. So is it that he's not good in sales meetings? Is it he's having sales meetings in the wrong companies? Is it that uh, he's I don't know, he's really good at matching, and that's what he should be doing, but you need to find out, right? And Elisa? Yes? I would, like, she want to go on a meeting with her, because maybe she's overselling it and saying unrealistic things, which raises the ends, but it doesn't Match. Or maybe, or maybe this was just raised, right? So, yeah, so, so maybe she sucks at matching, or maybe like ah, uh, she raised it like yesterday, so that's why there's ten raises and no matching. So. I don't, I don't <laughs> You're like, no, 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 no. that bitch cannot sell. See what she's <laughs> saying to these people because if she can raise ten TNs out of three meetings but not match anything or realize anything, it's okay. Yes. <laughs> I think it's more in the in the cold calling or actually making the sales meeting because she only. Uh, Books, one third of her contacts. So I think she should probably have some sort of portfolio training for like that. Anyone else? I'd, I'd say she looks really good at sales meetings. Yes. Right? Yes. Like, she's, she's really good at sales meetings. So, how can I get her to be on more of them? Uh, and how can I get other people, like, for example, how can I flip these two? How can I get her off having as many sales meetings as Rafa? How can I get Rafa being as efficient as she is? And maybe she sucks at matching, right? But yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah. So we we've talked about this already. What assignment could you give to each person to improve their performance? So how to use this to make your team perform? Yeah. Be consistent and track these KPIs every week and don't accept excuses. It's okay to accept reasons, right? So for example, when I led my sales team, people would say, "Yeah, I didn't have a sales meeting this week." What was important for me wasn't to get mad at them if they didn't have a sales meeting. It was that the whole group understood that that's not okay, right? And it doesn't mean we get mad. It's just like, okay, she didn't get a sales meeting this week, nothing to be mad about, we know that she's going to have two next week because that's the standard, right? And when you have that standard, you don't have to like be harsh with your team members or be random. It's just like, well, this is what we agreed to as a team, this is the standard, and you didn't complete it this week, so what are you doing next week to make it up? And that's, that's the only conversation you need. Like, why didn't you get it? Uh, you had that problem. Okay, so what are we doing to get two next week? Great. At least two next week. Uh, yeah, Question? You have to role model it. That's the only way, I, th I think that's the best way you can make them believe it, is you have to role model it. For example, with my team, the one sales meeting a week, I always had the most sales meetings. Which was hard, because I had a few salespeople that were like really good, so I was like, fuck. <laughs> I had to like go farther, even though I was leading the team and all this stuff, I had to go farther than them to show that like you, you could keep going farther. Uh, this is my very strong input to you guys. If people are not meeting the minimum standards, meet with them one time to understand why instead of planning for them to get back on track and still don't perform, fire them, reallocate them, whatever. The sales team is not where they're going to be successful right now. And they're going to make your whole sales team less successful. Um, and I'll, I'll give a, no, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, yeah, person needs this for the development, your team needs you focusing on them, and every leader learns this, blah, blah, blah. Be the role model, as I said. So uh, I've talked a little bit about my sales team. I just want to show you that this is like real, what I'm talking about. Uh, so this was what I was using to track my sales team back before I set US out of CRM. Uh, and this is in the third month uh, of my BB term, right? 
So these aren't all my sales members, by the way. So about half of them are sales members. About half of them are from other teams who were who also wanted to do sales because they were really interested in it, and like I was able to give them training, and so it was like yeah, everybody can do IJP. Uh, so it looks very similar to what I showed you, right? Like you have these different stages. For us in the U.S., leads was like you you've talked to someone and they want to talk to you about ISEC about, about the traineeship program. Whereas in the chart I was using, that was from Egypt, where leads are you had a meeting with them and they want more, want to hear more still. The colors represented if the number changed from the week before, right? So every week, very visually, I could just see uh, who's been active this week and who hasn't, and what have they done, right? So I could see, for example, uh, that uh, nobody had a pipeline moving from left to right. Like nobody had moved their entire pipeline. Everybody had only moved a part of it. So a lot of people in this week uh, didn't raise new leads, including myself, yeah? Uh, a lot of people got sales meetings, um, the sales meetings that a lot of people were having didn't convert so well to opportunities. Right? So this is in the third month. Now, as I told you guys, the semester before, so like three months before, our sales team had like two or three sales meetings in two quarters. Right? So I, I really mean this, that like if you give good training and if you lead by example, and you have a clear standard with your team and you're able to show them a vision and why they should do this, you really can get a lot of sales intensity in your LC very fast. By the third month, we had the most sales intensity in ISFUS. Um, so, just a question, how does this compare to your guys' LCs? Like, 36 meetings in, let's say, three months. Like, yeah. <laughs> no, no. Like, honestly not. But, does anybody have this much sales intensity? Yeah? Yes. Well, yeah, we did. Uh, in, from, it's from September till November. 33, but the main problem now is to really turn the interest into real raises. Yeah. And we did a lot of things. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean, there's, there's a, yeah, sorry? What's the difference between contract tens and TNs and raises? So there might be two contracts for 10 TNs. Right? So as you can see, my sales team is super new because we don't even have matches and realizations on the board. Like. That's not even a question. I mean, of course we don't have matches of realizations. We have nothing until now. Um, yeah, this is a screenshot from, from an email I sent them. Uh, and I would send them an email like this every week with the, with the update. So before, this, before the team meeting, we'd have this update. So we didn't have to talk about it in the team meeting. Yeah, this person had this much, this person had this much. Because everybody already knew that. We were only talking about how to do more and how to, like, how to help each other be better and stuff like that. Um, so a few things about having this many sales meetings. As you can see, there's a lot of people contributing. So it's two here, one here, two there, but it adds up. And, and those in the end add up to TNs as well. So there's, a, there's specific things we did for that. Uh, one is we had the EB role model being interested in IJP. Like, so we recognized, as many of you guys said, that we needed to create a culture of people wanting to do IJP. So several things we did for that. One, we made IJP, we branded it as like challenging. Like, it's not like hard, it's very challenging. So you should try to do IJP because it's gonna push you really far, right? So it was like a, the OGX people, the TM people, all of them would come to cold con training or come to sales meeting training because they thought it was like very interesting and valuable stuff to learn. And they, would, and they wanted to go on sales meetings and they would participate in our cold calling events because it was like, yeah, they can learn how to do this and it's a useful skill and it's a really big challenge. Like, I think that was the main thing. We had this like brand around like, yeah, challenge yourself. Um, and the EB helped us role model that. So this is the LCP, this is the VP Com, this is the VP Finance, this was the VP Projects. Like, and, and these three, those are all team members from the communications team that were, that were helping us, right? And uh, we had like an initiative in our LC, which was, we called it the 100 leads campaign. Stupid, I should have called it the 100 TNs, right? Because we got a shit ton of leads and no TNs. Um, and, and it was like every, every functional team should give 100 leads over to the IHIP team. And it was like, how many leads could they generate for it? By talking to family, by talking to professors, by networking themselves, by doing cold calls, how many leads could they get? And every functional team tried to get to 100. And it was like the first team to get to 100 would win. So each of the team leaders was also like role modeling that, right? Like they were trying to get leads for their team. Um, yeah, so it's like simple things that we, simple things we did to get more and more sales meetings because that for us at that time was the key to getting more results because in the past we just hadn't had sales intensity at all. Um, let me see. I wanted to share an example about this guy. So this is a person that I had a conversation with because he wasn't performing. So he wasn't performing at all. He was, smart. he was like, smart kid, you know he could, he just wasn't. 
So I had a conversation with him, and I was like, okay, so do you want to be on the team? That was like my first question, like, do you want to be here? Because if you want to be here, I would think that you would do stuff, but you're not doing anything, so do you want to be here? Uh, he said, yes, we talked about it, so we made a plan. Three weeks from now, you should have three sales meetings in this industry, uh, and then if so, then we're good. So he got two sales meetings in the industry, one of them was very good, I went with him. So at the end of three weeks, I had another meeting with him, and I was like, okay, so uh, thanks for doing all that. So you did two out of three, and I can see you were really trying, so like that's... I'm fine, like, let's move forward and let's like do more. About a year later, or not even a year, four months later he was back to doing nothing, right? Back to doing completely nothing, and then he left, right? So in the end, he didn't want to perform. Like, that's what that, that's what that showed. I was able to pressure him by like, by zeroing in on this issue, I was able to pressure him into performing for a very short period of time. But in the end he went back to what he wanted to do. Now maybe that was his like hero's journey and he dipped off instead of breaking through. Right? So I, I don't I don't think I was wrong to give him the chance, right? But I, I think I still learned a lesson from it, right? Is that people can turn something around, but you have to follow up on it for it to mean something. And just because they put in effort now doesn't mean that you fixed the issue and, and maybe you've just delayed it. Uh, yeah, so um, this is this is an email that I sent to my team and I would send these kind of team these kind of emails to my team every week. And I'm just showing this to you because I think it's useful for like the culture I had in my team, let's say. Um, so first about vision. The big picture is that we can each do a lot more as individuals to make this a top three sales team. So that was what I was motivating my team with, that we, we could be a top three sales team in the country. So maybe it should have been more purposeful. Back then, this is what I was what I was like telling them. Um, I, would, I, I broke down the whole team. Like, yeah, so this is, this is the issue with the whole team. No one in the team has a pipeline. There's a major difference in lead to meeting conversion rate. I can help you with that. Uh, and the largest contributors are from other members who are supposed to be helping us, but not doing our jobs. Like, you're actually not doing your job as well as the other members are, so like, there's a problem. And then, uh, for each person in the email, I wrote like such colorful emails, I don't do this anymore. Just so you can see <laughs> very, very strange. Uh, don't copy that. Yeah, uh, yeah so, so I, for every person I put what they basically needed to do, like what was my one sentence advice to them. So it was transparent for the whole team, right? And none of it is like mean, I don't think. It's just like clear. Like, yeah, so this is the situation. So Emma, VKS, and me have closed our opportunities, but that we haven't generated a new lead. Maya and Cherish have worked on other people's leads, but they're they haven't created a new pipeline. Tony and Mikey haven't done anything in April. Honeymoon over, right? Like yeah. That if you keep doing that, then you're fired. Um, yeah, and so the emphasis this week is that this week is this blitz, uh, and we need to follow up on all of our leads. And here's all the places you can do to get more sales meetings, and that's that, right? Question? Did you also, for help to Tony and Mike, did you also say it in person? Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, so on your piece of paper, uh, to get output of this section, you have a question. Are we also going to have to break it? Yeah, so we have people, the people section. And then, and then, then we'll have lunch with yeah. uh, So on your piece of paper, I want you to write what KPI will you track your team on every single week? And if you're an e if you're an LCP, I think you can think about this as well. If you're EB, like what what would you hold them accountable to every single week? Question. Um, yeah. So and you as Ethan, the RS are doing all the the cold calling. So I don't know if it's open to. Uh, he should be probably. Why wouldn't he be? It's more people are getting more sales meetings, right? What else is this? He's he's not comfortable with cold calling. Yeah. Like he doesn't want to do it. Ah, I mean, I, I can say it's cold calling. It works. It's not the only thing that works, but if you do it, you'll get results. Like. Yeah, I don't know. I, I always believe that people should use a variety of methods, and they should use a method that works best for them. Question? Uh, how do you get your PPR to let my member come to you? Okay, we'll get to the consultancy part of the session later, okay. or the day. So later in the day, I'll have a space just to ask questions, and I can give my thoughts, okay. whatever those are worth. Question? Uh, do your members have a certain number of hours uh, per work a week? Like, do you tell them you won't work no. more than five hours? No, but I don't. I don't set a standard one way or the other. With with my members, I never said like this is the minimum or this is the maximum. There's just like this is what we have to achieve. So, if you're achieving that, then we're good.
Okay? And uh, for each of your team members, I want you to put them in three categories. So I want you to have a list of your team members. Uh, they're performing awesome, meaning they're at what you would expect, uh, meaning like your high standard, right? So not, not like uh, they meet the minimum, but like this is what I think it takes to be a good member and they're at that or beyond it. So you're awesomely performing members. You're not performing but have potential to be an awesome performer. And not performing, it's time to give them one last chance and fire them in two weeks if necessary, if they don't live up to your new expectations. So I'll give you guys a few minutes to do that as well. And if every one of your team members falls in that category, I think that's okay. Because that's where, like, it's not a good thing, but that's where they are in real life. So it's better to know it and act on it than ignore it. Give you guys another minute. Realizations? We had 12 that year. 12 TNs realized that. I mean, in Brazil, that's like kids play. That's lunch. That's lunch. <laughs> Okay, so I guess people are randomly leaving. <laughs> That's fine. It always feels like pizza. They're, they're that motivated to go lead their teams. <laughs> uh, yeah, so hopefully you can put all of your team members in there. Like, it's worthless to do that exercise if you don't act on it. I know it's difficult. That's part of your leadership journey as well, right? That's part of your breakthrough is... Becoming a person that's capable of holding people to a standard of being a better version of themselves. Uh, and and uh, I would just say, uh, be a role model. Yeah, be a role model as well. Um, yeah, so this next this slide, I, I think I already told you all these things. Uh, just one, one thing I want to emphasize, yeah, so we're number one IG PLC the next year. Uh, but I want to emphasize the leadership development that my team members got, because I know that you guys are like, ah, oh, but it's, like, maybe it's so, like, harsh or something. But four of my sales team went on to EV roles. Uh, four were on the NST. Uh, one went to the MC, and one applied for MCP abroad. Uh, she didn't get it. I think she would have been fantastic, but she didn't get it. Um, so I, I think they got a lot of leadership development out of this experience as well, uh, which I'm very, very proud of. So last thing. I know this uh, this has taken a while, so I apologize. 
Uh, last thing is about what it means to lead people. Uh, so we already talked in the previous session about leading people is this inner and outer journey. So this is what I was talking about earlier. You have the outer journey elements and the inner journey elements. Um, so I want to break this down into how do you lead an outer journey and how do you lead people's inner journey. Uh, so on your blank piece of paper, yes, <laughs> trying to make this useful for you guys. So write each of your team members. I should have just given you like a sheet that you put your team members and then lots of different columns on it. <laughs> Sorry about that. So uh, what is each person's goal in terms of results in your team? Uh, how many TNs are they supposed to raise? How many TNs are they supposed to realize? How many meetings are they supposed to have? Whatever goals you have, what are the goals for each person? And what are you doing? Then, <laughs> yeah. then that's, I think you know the answer to that. <laughs> then you should make them. Uh, with them, hopefully. At a time when they're feeling very motivated. So you can write each person's goals in terms of results. Uh, and. And I would just like you to think for each team member, for that, for them to achieve their goals, or if you don't have numerical goals, what you think they should be achieving in your mind, do you think you're right now pushing that person too much, the right amount, or not enough? He's like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Ask that. Or in their term, in their TMP role. Okay. So I don't know if you do TMP by three months or six months or a year. But... Da -da -da -da. I see some people still writing. That's fine. My next question is: What support does each person need to perform? And the obvious. Successor to that is have you made sure they get that support. So these are things you should know basically about your team members, that is my assessment. That you should know what is their goal. To get to their goal, are you pushing them too much? The right amount? Not enough. What support do they need? Like what's the gap for them between who they are now and who can achieve those goals? And are you giving them the support or making sure that they get it? Might not come from you, right? But are you helping them get the support they need to reach that next level? For the sake of time, I'm going to move on, but of course you can finish this exercise on your own uh, whenever you want. So yeah, leading people's outer journeys, uh, have clear goals, clear strategies, and empower them to achieve them. So they should have a clear goal. At, as I said, like with my team, it was here's what you should achieve every week. That's not a goal, it's more of a KPI, right? Like here's what you should achieve every week. I don't care how you do it. However you do it, I'll help you. You know, like I'm glad to give you my perspective, advice, if you want to do it through cold calling, I'll train you on that. If you want to do it through networking, I'll bring you to a networking event, whatever. Um, but you're empowered to achieve it the way you think in whatever. And in, in my, when I, when I was leading, they were also empowered to do it in whatever industry they thought was best. Because we didn't have any market research or data or past experience or anything, right? We were starting from scratch. So it's like, yeah, let's go sell wherever and we'll find out what works. Right? But hopefully you guys have, I mean, I think your MCs all have like market segments for you to focus on based on research they've done and past experiences. So. Uh, so part of the outer journey is a challenging role and environment. The role is as challenging as you make it, and you should be challenging them. You should be demanding of your team. It doesn't mean that you're mean to them. It means you're trying to make them better. You're trying to like bring out the best in them. That's going to happen if you're more demanding. And I encourage you to make the team and yourself the person's support system. So if they're not able to do this, how do you help them? How does that person help them? If they don't have time for this, how can we support you? How can we do that? Right? You want people to 
You want people to basically always have the ability to succeed, which means you should take away the things that are that are stopping them. You know, and then it's only up to them. You want to make it as much up to them to succeed as possible. I think. And <clears throat> this outer journey is facil like so. These are the things you should do. I want to give you advice on where do you do those? Like, what are the spaces for that? So the the spaces for to provide the outer journey is the team meetings you have. So I don't know if you meet with your teams weekly or bi-weekly or, or whatever. I met with my team weekly. Um, and the team meeting is where you can keep people clear on the vision and goals. It's where you can track the goals and show everyone's results. So that's where the challenging environment comes in. That's where the accountability comes in. And it's where you can facilitate the support for people's bottlenecks. So you're supposed to be providing them a support system. The team meeting is the place to make sure they get that support. So if they say that, yeah, I didn't raise a sales meeting because of this, or I'm really having trouble matching this account because of this, Okay, so we're going to solve that by you two having a conversation. Or, okay, let's meet Wednesday at this time and we'll solve that, right? That, that's what should happen in the team meeting. Fix the problems. Uh, you all have the slides, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. Um, about inner journeys, uh, I, I won't have you do the exercise. Um, so, but what I would ask you is for each person, who, who on your, for each person on your team, who are they trying to become? What is the development that they're seeking? And in my experience, it very rarely do team leaders know that. Do they, do they really know, like, yeah, this is what this person is fighting for? For example, if I were to ask you guys, like, what is it you're fighting for in your ISIC experiences, how many of you think your team leader knows that? Or, like, knows what person you're trying to become? I don't know. I think my team leader knows, because I have a very good team leader, you know? And he asks. Uh, how does their role help them become that person? That is, like crucial information for you as a team leader because when they're at that rock bottom or in encountering challenges the vision of who they want to be is what you need to bring to them right you need to remind them of the vision of who they're trying to become okay you said from this role you wanted to learn sales skills you want to be more professional and you wanted to like be courageous okay so this is your chance to be courageous like this is a challenge for you you know you always want to appeal to the vision that they have so that they can break through otherwise like if you're just talking about numbers it's like um, that's not what drives most people. What drives most people is they more the intrinsic things. Um, yeah, and I would just ask you guys, when is the last time you spoke to your team members about their development? And, and not just like, how's your experience, but are you becoming who you want to? What are you getting out of this? What, have you learned anything about your values from this experience? Like Things like that. As a team leader, the same as you should push them in performance, you should push them as people to be who they say they want to be. I don't, I don't know how to, I don't know if it makes sense when I say it this way, but like, for me it's always like, I want to fight for the person they're trying to become. I don't know if that makes sense when I, when I say it, but. Um, so that means sometimes being mean, being like mean to them, right? Because they're being a shitty version of themselves. And you're like, well, I'm not going to accept that because I know that you're better than that. So I'm going to treat you poorly if you want to be treated poorly. So leading people's inner journeys, yeah, it's pretty simple. Know what they want out of their role. Uh, it corresponds to the stuff from the previous slide. Treat them as though they are that person. So if someone says, I want to be responsible, give them responsibility. You know, if someone says, like, I want to be innovative, like, challenge them to innovate things. Um, yeah, sorry. And the, the spaces for the inner journey are coaching sessions as well as team days. So I'll just give you guys my insight and advice into what, what could go in a coaching session to make it really effective. Uh, so first thing in a coaching session I would recommend is to understand someone's self-assessment of their performance. In the end, people are going to make decisions based on what they think, not based on what you think. So it's not useful, as useful, for you to say, this is what I think you should improve. You need them to think, this is what I should improve, right? So you want them, you want them in the beginning of a coaching session, you know, you ask questions like, so how do you think you've been performing in the last two weeks, right? And then they'll say, yeah, well, I've been kind of behind, and, you know, or like, yeah, I don't feel committed enough, or blah, blah, blah. Then you can help them solve that problem, rather than saying to them, I don't think you're committed enough. Yes, I am. Like, what are you talking about? Prove it. You know, I mean, it's, you're not like conflicting with them. You're just agreeing. And if they're not being honest with themselves, then you push them to be more honest with themselves. And that's when you give honest feedback, right? So you, you want to hear someone's self-assessment, and then you want to say, yeah, I agree with that. Um, thanks for saying that. That means a lot. Let's get over that. Or like, well, to be honest, I think you didn't say this, and I think that's something that's true, you know? And, and I believe very much in giving people honest feedback. You're their team leader. Who in their life is going to give them honest feedback about their experience and, and how good they are at their job and if they're giving their best, if not their team leader? So either you do that or they just go through life never getting honest feedback about how they are as a team member. Uh, I think it's your responsibility to give them honest feedback. And I, I mean, that, that can be like difficult things to say, right? Like, I feel like you're scared. 
or I think you can work harder, or I feel like you need validation too much, right? Like those are like heavy things, right? But in my opinion, that is your role as a team leader. Of course, if you've never said those kinds of things to your team before, like I wouldn't recommend you just like launch into all that right away, but maybe you like warm them up to it. Be like, okay, so in this meeting, I'd like to be like more honest than maybe we've been in the past or something, and then you can let one of these fly, right? And, and see how they, how they deal with it. But again, like, they need honest feedback as human beings, the same as you need honest feedback to become a better version of yourself. And if people aren't giving it to you, they're letting you down. Fight for the better version of your team member and coaching them. Uh, yeah, and, and make changes in the role or give people assignments to help them be more successful. So it sort of connects to what we were talking about earlier with performance. So you can move them to another function, move them to another part of the process, give them a new challenge, give them a specific assignment to help them overcome a challenge, anything. But your goal is to make them more successful as a person and a performer. Another space for the inner journey is team days. I don't know how many of you guys do like team days with your teams. I think like, uh, what? Monthly. Monthly. Wow. Uh, I would say so, but that's cool. I mean. How much? How much? Sorry, I didn't mean to unleash a storm. Uh, I I would I would more do it by milestone. So rather than like every three months, every month, I would more do it like. So here's what we were trying to achieve in this like six week period, or like here's what we were trying to achieve here, and we did. So or it, that period is over. So let's reflect on it. So like, with with my MC team, for example, like we so didn't what do is it. A team day? Yeah. Sorry. So a, a team day is like you go somewhere, or it could just be your house or something, but you try to create a space where your team can reflect as a group on their experience, uh, understand each other's experiences, and make commitments about how they want to do it differently or better in the future. Um, yeah, so I, I think I think it makes more sense to do it based on we had this short term purpose and now let's reflect on that and what we learned from it rather than like we've been together for a month or we've been together for two months. I mean that's fine I think. But for example, with my MC team, like we would we would call it milestone period. So from our national conference with everybody in the country to our regional conferences was a milestone period. Or from our national president's meeting where the where the LCPLX were to the uh, first regional conference after the, na after, like, the National Conference of all the EBs was a, a milestone period because there was like one mission we had to fulfill in that time, right? So then at the end, we can say, did we achieve it or not? How do we feel about it? What did we learn? Uh, so within your team days, like, I mean, this is, you could, we could have a whole day about how to do team days, right? But like very simply, big picture, people should share their challenges, accomplishments, and what they've learned. People should get honest feedback from their teammates and from you. And there's different methods of facilitating feedback. Uh, and if, you, if you're not sure, just look at online resources. You can find lots of methods for how to facilitate feedback. Uh, make sure that there's a space to understand people's values where people can declare, like, yeah, so this is what I've discovered is really important to me. This is what I want to concentrate more on in the future, things like that. Uh, and there should be some vision of the future and commitments toward it. So, for example, so what do you want to change about yourself in the next quarter or you know, for the, over the next milestone period, like, uh, how as a team should we, you think we should be better? And then, okay, this is what we decided as a team, so let's make a commitment towards that. Like, we all write it, or we sign something, or we do handprints, or we put balloons in the sky, or anything. Symbolic things that make us feel like heroes, right? S just another thing about leading people's inner, jersey, inner journeys, surprise people. It's a very simple piece of advice. It's just like a GCP from my side, okay? Just surprise people, do thoughtful things for them, leave them notes, like, make them a present, uh, make them a scrapbook, like, people love this shit, okay? Uh, and, and it, of course, like, I say that flippantly, but you should make it, like, meaningful and sincere, right? Um, it, I think that can make a ton of difference. If, if in the end, your people, your people know that you care about them, it makes a world of difference. And it means that when you hold them accountable, when you give them honest feedback, they're more likely to listen because you've proven to them that you care about them, and you're not just being mean, you know? Uh, so very simply, your people need you to be honest, even when it's difficult. They need accountability, even if it means firing them. Uh, and they need your support in overcoming their bottlenecks. Yeah, so as a recap of everything I've talked about, about leadership and leading a sales team, I just talked about purpose, like how to lead your team on purpose, how to make them perform, and then how to lead them as people. Uh, in purpose, we talked about the hero's journey and how you, through the purpose of your team, and through the purpose that that person has as a team member, get them to go through challenges and break through. Uh, in terms of performance, that you have a very clear tracking system with a standard KPI every single week, and you hold people accountable to that, and you give them coaching based on how, what do they need to do better in each step. And for people, you just need to lead them through the inner and outer journey, 
And outer journey, you do by having effective team spaces that hold people, that basically fulfill these things, make sure they're getting support, provide like challenge them, make them like, push them to do more, make them accountable for their goals and responsibilities. On the inner journey, make sure people have their personal goals, that they reflect on their experience, they understand themselves, and they make a commitment for the future. Yes. Uh, about this outer inner journey, is this the, the new one that was? Yeah. Is it already on my other one? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's the refreshed inner outer journey. Yeah. Refreshed. Yes. It implies it's better, right? Very good. Uh, yeah, so that's everything for leading a sales team in JP. Very sorry to rush the thing at the end, but I had a feeling people wanted to go to lunch. Uh, so I also wanted to go to lunch. So. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, any immediate questions? We'll also have consultancy later, but just any questions that like this content wasn't clear or I have a question about this. Cool. Then before everybody like gets nuts and goes crazy, Raphael, uh, what can we do to have everyone fed and back by 3 p.m., which is in an hour? Well, uh, here in nearby the university, there's like this Chinese place where you can get lunch in five minutes. It's pretty good for my drink here from the week. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, no, I don't think it's going to be much. Okay. There's an ATM nearby. And one question. In case anyone doesn't like Chinese, is there anything right next to it that people can uh, eat? In the school, there's, uh, they sell sandwiches. So That's in the in school? In the school. That's good. Yes. Then we need to get lunch here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so then, then uh, does it, would anyone want sandwiches instead of Chinese? <laughs> Two people? Uh, so then... Uh, can we go there on the way to the Chinese place so we can yeah, like yeah, drop them there, go get Chinese? Can we eat in the Chinese place or do we have to bring it back? We can eat there. Okay, then how about this? Raphael, could you go with them to get sandwiches and then bring them to the Chinese place? Would that work? Everyone else, we'll go get Chinese. Yeah? Uh, remember the yeah. <laughs> okay, can, we, can they leave their things here? Or do they, have to leave? They, they can, but... Uh, I'm staying. You're staying here. Stay you're staying here the whole time. Yeah. So you're gonna watch everything. You're gonna watch everything. Okay. Oh my god. <laughs> watch everything. Watch everything. Okay. You, yeah, you can leave your things here. Uh, um, do you know that we're going to? Uh, did it record? Okay, uh, 12 hours? Yeah. Okay. Uh,